God's not dead. He's alive. Well, God's not dead. No, he's alive. God's not dead. No. to the Gospel of John, chapter 10. The Gospel of John, chapter 10. <coughs> Very familiar verse of Scripture. Jesus was, was teaching his disciples that he is the good shepherd and that the good shepherd would lay down his life for his sheep. And uh, we're going to read... <coughs> one verse of scripture and I'll tell you that one thing that makes Jesus stand out from the world is his generosity. Yeah. Amen. Jesus is a giver yeah. and not a taker. And he gives <coughs> from an unlimited supply. His resources have no end. Amen. Um, I was reading about an asteroid that NASA has been keeping their eye on. Not only NASA, but but uh, the space barons who, uh, you know, they they're they're in it for profit. They're watching this asteroid called Sixteen Psyche, and it is in orbit uh, between Mars and Jupiter. One theory I read is that that it may have been a planet that died uh, early on uh, at the creation. And so the reason they think that is because it is made primarily of iron with gold and platinum and other precious metals on it. And so their NASA is actually planning on sending a probe uh, to 16 Psyche. And they're, they're not talking about bringing anything back from it, but they want to see what it is. And uh, they, they think uh, through spectrographic readings that it's made out of iron primarily. <clears throat> and so they estimate the worth of this asteroid at, now this number, you're not going to get it. I don't, I, I don't get it either. It's 10,000 quadrillions in dollars. Okay. And so... Uh, I did some some math and just trying to break it down. And uh, uh, in our world economy in 2020, the uh, the value or the worth of the world economy last year was 400.2 trillion dollars. And even that number is too big for us to get our our heads around. But the value of 16 psyche is about 25 times the entire world's wealth. So, it, you know, it's just this astronomical uh, number. And my point in bringing that up is this, that this is just one rock going around this orbit of the sun that, that has this incredible value and it belongs to God. Amen. <laughs> just one. You know, and so... God, when he gives to us, it is out of eternal resources. It is out of uh, unlimited resources. You know, we were in the Sunday school this morning and Brother Otto was talking, he saw a program about the Hubble 
telescope that it's reached uh, it's reached some of the outer limits and and is looking outward and is is seeing new uh, galaxies and new uh, things being still still being uh, created that it's an expanding universe and so you know we live on this little tiny blue planet called Earth you know we're third from the sun and uh, you know we we our, our thinking can be kind of small and I just want to help you to expand your thinking a little bit this this morning and understand who it is that you serve amen, amen. amen. who it is that we serve who is this Jesus? Who is this God of creation? And so I want to preach a, a simple message I've entitled, The God of Abundance. Amen. And so let's read this one verse, John 10, 10. It says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly amen so what we have in this in this verse in this text is a contrast there is a comparison taking place here the the comparison is between the thief and the lord and i just want to uh, talk about that contrast for just a moment jesus and the devil are polar opposites they are opposite each other. There is no, uh, there is no middle ground. It's it's either light or darkness. And so, uh, Jesus makes this statement. He says the enemy is a taker. He's a thief, a destroyer, and a killer. But the Lord is a giver. Amen. Jesus is a giver of life. And this is a life that is full of every good thing. James wrote in James 1.17, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of he heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And so we have this comparison that, that here is the, the thief. Jesus calls him the thief. He's, he's referring to the devil, and he's re referring to himself. And he says, we're like night and day. God is good, the devil is evil. Yeah, yeah. Amen. God is light, the devil is darkness. And what he says in this text is that the enemy of our soul intends to harm. That's his, that's his modus operandi. Jesus describes the devil's character as a liar and a murderer. Speaking to the Pharisees in John 8, 44, Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. And he says this, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. And so we see this contrast. The devil is a being full of hatred, full of bitterness, full of envy toward God and his children. Amen. He said he was a liar. He was a thief. He was a murderer from the beginning. How many know the devil ripped off the human race? Adam and Eve had a perfect setting in which they lived. And Satan came to Eve, and you know what he did? He lied to her. And, and in his own twisted way, he got her to not look at all the abundance of the blessing of the things that God had given them, and got her to focus on the one thing that God said you can't have. Isn't that twisted? He does the same thing with us, doesn't he? You know, how come, how come the things that we can't have look so good? Often the things that we're not supposed to touch are so tempting. Amen. You know, like last week, we had uh, fellowship and 
And uh, Sister Charlene did me dirty and brought brownies. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a stash of them. <laughs> and I touched them all week long. <laughs> How come things we're not supposed to have, we, we just want? It's like we got to have it. And so, but Saint, this is what Satan did, is he got Eve to look at what she couldn't have and took all her eyes off all the blessings. That was all around her. Everything was available. That was a dirty trick, wasn't it? Yes. You look at how Satan treated Job. How many here have read the book of Job? Amen. Oh, you read the book of Job and it's like, poor Job. But Satan hated him. And I'll tell you something, he hates every one of us too. And so Jesus describes the devil's character as a liar and a murderer. One who intends to harm. But the contrast is the Lord who intends to bless. Amen. Amen. In contrast to the devil, Jesus did only good to men. Amen. He did only good. This is the testimony of the Apostle Peter at the house of Cornelius, Acts 10, 37 and 38. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed, who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Amen. That's Jesus' testimony on the earth, that he went about doing good, healing the sick, healing those who were oppressed by the devil. Jesus came and he made war against Satan. He didn't make war against men, he made war against the devil. Men wanted him to go to war against other men, but he didn't come to do that. He came to make war against sin. The Apostle John wrote later in 1 John, he said, for this purpose, Jesus came into the world to destroy the works of the devil. Yes. <clears throat> and even to the end, the very end of his life, Jesus was doing good. You know, here he is hanging on the cross, and what does he do? He saves a repentant thief who's crucified next to him. He said, assuredly, this day you will be with me in paradise. Showing mercy to the very end. From the cross, he prayed for his tormentors and for people throughout all the ages. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And God has mercy upon us. And He the greatest act of mercy that God ever showed for us was when Christ went to the cross. Amen. You know, and so in, our, in, in, our, in this chapter of John chapter 10, Jesus talks about himself as the, as the great shepherd the good shepherd, who lays down his life for his sheep. He said, no man takes my life from me, but I give it of myself. What a contrast. Satan comes to destroy. He comes to steal. He comes to kill. But Jesus, he comes to bless. He comes to save. He comes to forgive. He comes to deliver. What a contrast. We see the promise of a full life here. Because what Jesus said, he said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Amen. This word life is, is, is the word zoe, Greek word zoe, which describes both physical and spiritual life. Amen. And so God is the author of all life. He's the author of everything that exists. The, the world, the worlds and everything in them exist at his pleasure. God created everything. And so God could make this kind of promise. The promise of life. He said, I came to give you life. You know what? We all need the life that Jesus gives. Yes. Because without Jesus, we live in death. Yes. We may be breathing 
and our hearts may be pumping and our cells working and everything uh, working as it should, but we are still without Christ spiritually dead, separated from God because of our sin. And so Jesus came to give us not just our physical life, but eternal life. Amen. Amen. Life that endures forever. He created everything, and so he can make this kind of promise. Acts 17, 28, Paul was preaching. He said, for in him we live and move and exist. As some of, we, of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Amen. We, we continue to live at his pleasure. And so he says, I came to give them life. And he was talking about spiritual life. Amen. He said, whoever believes in me shall never die. And if they die, they shall live again. Amen. But he makes this promise. It's, it's a further promise that I want to examine with you for just a moment. He says, more abundant life. More abundantly. So when you look up that phrase, what this means, this is speaking of the super abundance of God. We're talking about overwhelming abundance. This is kind of, you know, why I thought of 16 Psyche, because here's this rock spinning, floating around in space, you know, in orbit between Jupiter and, 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 uh, and Mars. And, uh, you know, the men on Earth are looking at this thing and they're seeing dollar signs, you know, because it is so valuable. You know, and there are people who are actually wanting to go and mine it. So, you know, this, this shot to, to Mars, that's one thing. But, there, you know, people, men have, they have, uh, uh, you know, a lot of ambition. And so, God, when we talk about the God of abundance, it, it's equally true to say God is the God of more than enough. Amen. Amen. See, we don't need ourselves, we don't need millions. We don't need a lot of money. Right? There are people who do have a lot of money and I don't begrudge them that. But the truth is, all of us can only eat so much. Amen. You know, we can only drive one car at a time. Amen. We can only wear, you know, one set of clothing at a time. I mean, you can have a, a, a wardrobe that is that is, you know, packed to the gills, but you can still only wear one thing. You can only carry one purse, ladies. Well, I don't know. I've seen some carry more than one, but one pair of shoes. And the point is, God is the God of more than enough. In John 16, 12, and 13, um, I think it was actually John 6. I put 16, but it's John 6. It says, when everyone was full, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over so that nothing will be wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. You know, if you're a Bible reader, you know that's the story where Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fish. You know, a little boy had his lunch of five, five barley loaves, which was the cheap bread. You ever go to the store and buy the cheap bread? You know, this was the cheap bread and, and, and uh, two small fish. And what happened is Jesus did a miracle. He multiplied the loaves and the fish. And when they, when it was all said and done, everyone was full and there was more than enough. They gathered the fragments, 12 baskets full. See, so when Jesus spoke of a more abundant life, he was not exaggerating. He can do everything that he promised and more. Amen. That's the point. That's what God does. So what we have is the promise of a full life from the one person who can give it. Amen. Amen. He said, I came to give them life and life more abundantly. And so let me let me close with this, this thought about the heart of God. 
Because this is what is revealed in Jesus. God's heart is to bless. He said, the thief comes to steal and kill. There's the contrast. But I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. We're speaking about motive and motivation. How many know motives are important? Amen. Why you do something is important. You know, have you heard the term ulterior motives? Right. Like somebody does something nice for you and you're like, um, what do you want? You ever, you ever felt that? Like this isn't, this isn't their normal behavior. And so you think they've got an ulterior motive. Like there's something that they want that they're not really telling me about, but I got a feeling pretty soon I'm going to find out what it is. And so I was thinking about God's ulterior motives. You know, an ulterior motive is something to gain. You want to gain something for yourself. And so I was thinking about this. What is God's ulterior motive in what he did? What is he seeking to gain? You know, it's not very complicated. What he's seeking to gain is us. It's us. It's you. It's me. Why did he do that? So he could win our hearts. Amen. So he could win our love. See, that's the thing about love is, you know, people, they're so desperate for love. And they, they think they can force somebody to love them. That's not possible. You don't get love by taking. You get love by giving. Amen. And this is what God did. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's God's ulterior motive. This is God's heart. What did God do this for? He came to take back what the enemy stole from us. What did he steal? He steals our lives. Amen. He steals our joy. He steals our minds. He steals our families. <coughs> He's a thief. For the thief does not come, but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He stole our relationships with our Heavenly Father. He stole our life because sin kills us spiritually and separates us from God. That's the heart of God. He came to, to give us blessings. God's heart is to bless. The enemy's heart is to curse. And so here's the gist of this. That men fear, and women, they fear to give of themselves to God because they misunderstand him. They think God just wants to take stuff from me. God just wants to take what I have. And when you stop to think about it, what do we have? What do we have? Uh, really, what do we have? We might have a little bit of property. We might have a little money in the bank. We don't really, we don't have much. When you compare your worth to God's worth, for crying out loud, this rock is just floating around in space that is 25 times more valuable than the whole earth and everything in it. What do we have? So we fear to give God ourselves or any of our possessions. We must understand that everything we have has been given to us by him. We must understand that even if we gave all to his kingdom, that he's a God of unlimited resources. Amen. That he is the miraculous God 
of super abundance. Yeah. He's a he's a miracle working God. I've seen God do miracles. Yeah. I've seen God provide when I I could see no visible means of provision. There's a great story in Second Kings, chapter four. I'll read this to you in seven verses. It says, one day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, my husband who served you is dead, and you know how he feared the Lord, but now a creditor has come, threatening to take my two sons as slaves. What can I do to help you, Elisha asked. Tell me, what do you have in the house? Nothing at all. Sounds like a pretty bad situation. In those days, they didn't just repossess your car, they took your children, or they took you and made you a slave until you paid the debt. And so he says, what do you have in the house? Nothing at all except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elisha said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it is filled. So she did as she was told, her sons bringing her jars, bringing jars to her, and she filled one after another. Soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, now sell the olive oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on what is left over. Amen. We're talking about the God of abundance. Yes. The God of super abundance. We're talking about a miracle working God. Yeah. What an astonishing story that is. So she's got a little flask of olive oil and this incredible debt and nothing that she can do about it except what the man of God told her to do. She believed evidently because she sent her sons out to gather as many jars and pots as they possibly could. Imagine how ridiculous it must have sounded to her when Elisha says, Start pouring the oil into the pots. <laughs> One little flask of oil and a pot. And miracle of miracles, as she began to pour, it didn't run out until it was completely full to the brim. Filled them all up, was able to pay the debt and live on the rest. That's 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 the God I'm talking Amen. about. Yeah. Amen. Amen. The God, yeah. hallelujah. The God of abundance. Remember Jesus' words to Peter in Mark 10, verse 29 and 30. Remember I'm talking about giving yourself to God. Don't be afraid to give yourself to God because God has much more than us. Mark 10, 29 and 30. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the gospel. No one who's done this will fail to receive a hundredfold in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and fields along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. So I want to encourage you, brethren, Amen. do not be afraid to give to God. Understand who he is. He is the God of abundance. Mm -hmm. Understand his heart. He's watching over you to bless you, Amen. both physically and spiritually. And he will always make sure, listen to me, he will always make sure that what you have, what you need, and more. Amen. He's the God of abundance, super abundance. Let me read one last passage of scripture to you. Second Corinthians 9, verse 6 through 11. This is from the New Living Translation. Remember this. 
A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. That's, that just makes sense. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly in response or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Now listen to this, verse 8. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. The scriptures say they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources. So when, so then produce, and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way, so you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. Amen. 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 You know, that this is not primarily a, a sermon about money or or anything like that, although it does include money. This is a sermon about the God we serve. Yeah. And I want to encourage you, do not be afraid to give yourself to him. Do not be afraid to give of your resources to him. Because understand this, God has much more than we do. Yeah. And when you give to God, it does what the Bible says, it causes the heavens, the windows of heaven to be opened and a blessing to be poured out on your life that is so great you won't be able to receive it all. We're talking about abundance. We're talking about life to the full. We're talking about spiritual blessing. We're talking about a blessing within the family, within the home, where people can look at your life and see that you're blessed. Why? Because you've given yourself to the blesser. Amen. You've given yourself to the, the, the one person who can super abundantly bless you and whose heart is to bless you. Remember what Jesus said. The thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. Those are his words. Those aren't my words. Those are his words. That's his heart. That's his motive. He wants to bless you. Amen. So let's pray. Let's bow our heads together. In this assembly, we're going to dismiss and let you go your way. We appreciate you. We're thankful for every one of you. I'm glad you're here because I want you to know that God loves you. He really does. You know, what, is, what does God have to gain from us? We really, we can't make him richer. The greatest blessing that we can do to God is to give ourselves to him. Because that's really what he wants. He wants us to give ourselves to him. He wants us to love him back. You know, if we, if we could love God even a little bit, as much as he loved us, he'd take that. He'll accept that. You know, we get so dark in our hearts and our minds because of sin, because of this world that we live in. We can look at all the politics and be darkened. We can look at the crime. We can look at all the movies within governments. And we can look at the, the world economy and just become gloomy. We can look at our situation in, that we have in this life, the things we're dealing with personally, and our hearts to be so darkened. 
But I want to encourage you this morning. Stop looking at all those things and look to Jesus. Because he is the author of life. He is the giver of life. He's the one who can turn everything around. He's the one who can take a person who is so in debt that they're about to lose everything. But if they'll just obey God, God will restore everything. Like that widow and her oil and her sons. All she did was obey God. And God made sure she not only had enough, but more than enough. Sometimes we can limit God by our lack of faith. But I want to encourage you and challenge you to believe God enough this morning to give yourself to Him. Give your life to Jesus. He's the answer. You've come here today and you're not right with God. You're not born again. Listen to me. In giving your life to Jesus, you have absolutely nothing to lose and everything to gain. Amen. He said, your enemy, all he's trying to do is kill you, destroy you, rip you off. But the one who really loves you only wants to bless you and give you life. He proved his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So this morning, you've come, you're not right with God, you want to give your life to Jesus, I'd like to pray for you. If you want prayer, lift up your hand and hold it for just a moment. Say yes, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you. Who else? Anyone else? Quickly. Lift up your hand and say yes, Pastor. I believe Jesus loves me. I believe he died for me. Maybe you're a backslider. And tonight, today, you're, you're, God's just touching your heart. And you realize it. He loves me. The scales of darkness are falling away. You're looking unto Jesus. And you're seeing he loves me. He'll forgive me. He'll restore me. That's his heart. If you want to get right with God, your back's on your lift your hand. We'll pray. God will touch you. God is merciful to you. Amen. His mercies are new every single morning. God's dealing with you. Lift your hand. We'll pray. God's going to do a miracle in your life. Okay, so while our heads are bowed, we're going to say a prayer. If you're watching this on online later, you can pray this with us. But mean this from your heart. Unsaved, backslider, pray this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins, for the things that I've done that have offended you. I believe you died on the cross to take away my sin. And I ask you to forgive me. Jesus, come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. Right now, Lord, I give myself to you to do your will. Change me. I put my life into your hands. I'm tired of living under a curse and I need your blessing. Bless me now, Jesus. Bless me with eternal life and forgiveness of sin. Thank you for loving me so much. And I pray, help me to love you back. Help me to give myself completely to you to do your will from now on. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take a few minutes and open our altar for prayer. We're talking about this God of abundance who has so much to give us. And he's not unwilling to give it to us. He's absolutely willing. But we must do our part and give ourselves to him. Amen. So we're going to open the altar for prayer. And God's spoken to you. If you prayed the sinner's prayer with me, I want to encourage you to get up from your chair and just come and find a place to pray here at the altar. Amen. And God's spoken to you otherwise. And these altars are open. I want to encourage you to come find a place to pray or turn there to your chair, kneel. 
before God and uh, and you talk to Jesus. Amen. We're going to stand together and sing that that song. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. <coughs> Let's all stand together. When the music fades, all is stripped away. Thanking God for his goodness. 
I'll pray. Father, I'm grateful to you. Thank you for loving us. Yes, Lord. Jesus. Thank you for giving so much to us, your own son, the dearly beloved God. You sacrificed him for us. And I pray, Lord, help us to remember that. Help us to remember who you are, that you are the possessor of heaven and earth. And deliver us from fear of giving ourselves to you. Help us to trust you with all our heart, with all our mind, God, to not lean on our own understanding. Help us not to be wise in our own eyes, but help us to do your will, to sacrifice all that we are and all that we have to do your will. Thank you for blessing us so much. I thank you for all these who've come this morning, and I pray that the word that was spoken this morning would be sealed in every heart. Help us not to forget who you are, the God who loves us, and the God who has given his own son for us. We're grateful, Lord, and we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. God bless you.